You just boot it up the stove. And then, this is how fast we can boil a liter of water. It takes about 40 seconds to boil it. And as they say, a watch pot boils. <laughs> Could any other like? No. <laughs> <laughs> The idea was basically, what if you can cook pizza really fast? I was getting really obsessed with a brick oven pizza, and you need crazy high power to actually cook the pizza in 45 seconds. What if you could do that at a consumer level in a tabletop device and realize that you'd have to put a battery in the appliance because you were limited by your 120 volt plug in your wall would not have enough watts to basically cook a pizza. You can put a battery in the appliance, which will let you boost the power temporarily. You could run at much higher power for maybe 10 or 20 minutes. You're not continuously cycling pizzas through, you're not running a pizza Pizzeria, you're making a couple pizzas for your friends. That light bulb moment made me realize, wait, what if you could also make that battery useful for the rest of the building? What if you make that battery useful for the grid? What's that story look like? That kind of made us think, what appliance to actually do first? And we realized that stoves were kind of the one where if you wanted to convince someone to fully ditch natural gas, this is the one thing that was left. This is the one like mental block that was not gonna be possible to address basically. Traditional stoves haven't changed in decades. Gas stoves, induction stoves, electric stoves, all the other things. And so what people don't get though is what their stove is. So you see a glass rectangle on your counter, you assume it's bad because you assume it's a electric stove. There's basically a light bulb underneath it that takes minutes to heat up and then you end up burning whatever you had in the pot. People love their cast irons for a reason, which is that thing has thermal mass. And so low, medium and high will then approximately map to a temperature because the cast iron will essentially hold temperature correctly. People People get emotional about their pan choice when in reality that's actually just covering up the fact that their stove doesn't work very well. Also there's this whole debate over gas stoves and in reality they suck. When you think of the kitchen in a commercial kitchen sense and it's like crazy hot and like they have to run EC and like all these other things, that's because gas stoves actually don't heat the pan very efficiently. They heat the room more than they heat the pan. So you're about 35 to 45% efficient in terms of being able to couple the energy from the gas flame to the pan itself. The other thing with gas is like, there's a bunch of health risks. When you burn something in the presence of nitrogen, the nitrogen and oxygen can combine to form nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen oxide. It's the constituent components of smog. It's way worse than people think. If I cook inside, this is a potential risk to my kids. It could cause asthma. It could exacerbate existing issues. There's like a prepper attitude of like, hey, what if my power goes out? I can't use my stove. If you have a new gas stove, the valves turn off and you can't run it anyways, even when the power goes out. So it's actually a unique feature that we have versus modern gas stoves that we can work during a power outage. The whole gas stove debate. It's kind of like the government's going to take your gas stoves or whatever. Like that's not going to motivate people, but hey, this stove is just way better than any other stove it is going to motivate people. Forcing someone to change their mind is not a way to change their mind, but uh, making a better product is. And so we were like, we just have to make sure that we build the best possible thing. We're about three times more powerful than any other stove in the markets. When you set this thing to power boil, it will go to 10 kilowatts. And a normal stove is like three. We can actually boil a liter of water in about 40 seconds. So we ended up realizing that there was a second thing we really had to innovate on, which was the temperature sensors. We have temperature control for the first time on a, on a full-size induction stove. And we're actually able to use that over kind of the full range of power of the, the product, which is something that's not a usual interaction modality that people are particularly used to. Instead of low, medium, and high, you can set an exact temperature. And that lets us do everything from like, you can sear a steak without having to turn your smoke alarm off. You can cook rice without a rice cooker. I've also done things like where I can sous vide a steak just in a pan without any sort of like accessories. You don't need a plastic bag. You don't need anything like that. We're building a stove, right? So we end up cooking a lot. We end up using this day to day and like ended up having to organize a lot of things just to let employees cook all the time. Who's the best chef in the office? Um, we can debate that. Uh, <laughs> the other thing we've basically done and you'll see here is we went and bought everything of every various price point and kind of took it apart, figured out how it worked, made sure that like we were well benchmarked versus that. We've got all sorts of fun stuff over here. So like 3D printers, electrical lab. This cart is kind of funny because this is how we wheeled around the stove into... <laughs> <laughs> We're working on a harbor program, so we get stuff in the mail from our partners, including stoves. A big way of how we work at Impulse is we make sure we have the core engineering team here. We try to get tier one partners abroad, and that lets us upstaff the team pretty massively. So we end up having 2x more people than we have here working for our various partners on the program. So a lot of people are armchair geopolitical experts, whether they're VCs, whether they're founders, et cetera. The problem is basically if you're like starting to obsess over macro and you're starting to obsess over like geopolitics, those things operate on a timescale that is not necessarily compatible with the realities of you shipping a product 
in the next year or two. I think it's very admirable to try to build everything in the US and there's a ton of incentives to do so. The problem is if you want to do stuff fast and you want it to do it at high quality and you want to do it as a startup where you may not have like infinite budget, that is incredibly difficult because the number of partners that can actually execute a complex consumer device at high quality and do it in the United States that also will talk to you as a startup are approaching zero. There's a lot of precedence for Asia-based supply chain, even if you want to have a non-China production strategy to look abroad, just because the US never really booted up a consumer electronics supply chain. I think a big thing is understand the supply chain of the thing that you're building before you go and do it. And in some sense, the like how stuff gets built is an important thing to learn immediately, because once you know that, you know who to go talk to to scale it up and build it. I'm gonna dunk on my entire class of people, but basically there's a lot of tendency in the Bay Area to be like, we are the smartest people on the planet. Thus, we're just gonna redo everything from first principles. You should not do that. There is a ton of smart people globally and being able to leverage what already exists is a super, super, super big thing. A big mistake that a lot of people make is they think they're Elon and that's not true. A lot of people try to do this thing where they build the factory and they build the product. You are picking on maybe a problem that's a little bit too big, especially with, for consumer electronics, the factory already exists. There already are people that can build complex consumer devices on scale of VR headsets, drones. The vast, vast amount of consumer electronics scope goods, whether they're consumer electronics or not, you can generally go to a manufacturer to not just build it, but also help you co-design it. So pulling them in as early as possible is really important. I think one of the underrated things about building a hardware company is like the uh, the stuff that happens behind the scenes, which is like, it's not the like Tony Stark in the cave building the Iron Man suit. It's you and the rest of the team meeting a vendor team that you had never even interacted with before because you only met their US side representative over for dinner and drinks at a restaurant in a city you've never been to before. And being able to kind of emerge from that conversation, even if there was a language barrier with a, not two teams, but one team. People think that Impulse is, hey, we're making super high-end stoves, high-performance stoves, got all these capabilities, it looks cool, et cetera. But that's kind of a cover for the master plan here. And the master plan is to get a ton of batteries into every home in America at scale. We have what's called a bi-directional inverter in every product we ship. That inverter, when on a low current connection, can push power back into the home. If you extrapolate that to every home in America, there's about a 1.4 terawatt hour battery capacity opportunity just from residential. The, the, the end game is you can take multiple appliances from our portfolio because we're not stopping at one thing. They will combine I mean, maybe you can use Voltron as the reference or what, what you want, but like you can now install them in your kitchen, in your garage, various other places. The storage from each one will combine into one shared battery. That battery is then useful, not just for the home, but for grid support as well. We're able to actually put a lot more storage into buildings than would normally be possible because normally when you get a power wall, you have to basically rip up a lot of the electrical connections to the building. Like you have to put a box in between the electrical panel and the grid. You have to install the power wall in a slot that doesn't normally exist. You have to run new conduit. In our case, it's like, do you have a stove? Take the stove out, put ours in. We've got a number of prototypes here built at our factory already. We're in the process over the next couple of months to build a lot more of them. A number of those will be able to leave the building and end up at testers' homes and stuff like that, which is actually a thing we're really, really, really excited about. But this all leads to our uh, anticipated retail launch in um, the back half of this year. There are too many interesting things to unpack from this episode and Impulse as a company. Thankfully, we now have this new podcast where we can discuss things in depth and in the replies as well as with the founders. But quickly, I wanted to share a few of my kind of highlight thoughts about Impulse in a new way. Look at me, picture in picture. This has got to be the coolest origin story for like a startup ever. We wanted to make pizza. And then that results in like, let's make a company that will revolutionize the battery grid. <laughs> the way they approach designing the stove is really interesting. Like the knobs, for example, are removable. You can clean under them and, it's, and it looks beautiful, it feels great, and the UI is amazing. And then the Hot Topic thing a little bit, I guess in, in the S3 community, we're very pro on American manufacturing, but I like having a, another take in a take about building a specific company using a supply chain that exists to build and ship product and get in people's hands and, and houses and replacing their bad products with better ones that can provide more grid storage. I think it's a great way to approach it and I think it's good to see, to hear multiple sides of the coin. I think their master plan of, of a network of like batteries is insane. 
on the one hand, you have these master plans that then aren't always met with great product and design, or sometimes you have great product and design that doesn't always have a great master plan. And Impulse seems to be one of these rare combinations of, of, the, of the two. Big thank you to the Impulse team for having me over and letting me film with you guys. And, and thank you all for watching. I hope you liked the podcast for this episode. And I'll see you next week. Until then, keep on building the future.